Sutra. Then in the midst of the great assembly, the first come one bent his five wheeled fingers. After bending them, he opened them again. After he opened them, he bent them again, and he asked Ananda, What do you see now? Ananda said, I see the first come one's hundred jeweled wheeled palms opening and closing in the midst of the assembly. Commentary The Buddha was concerned that most people in the great assembly still had not understood the genuine seeing nature. Then in the midst of the great assembly, the first common bent his five-wheeled fingers. After bending them, he opened them again. After he opened them, he bent them again. At that time, the world honored one bent his fingers, then stretched them out again, then clenched and unclenched his fist several times, and he asked Ananda, What do you see now? What do you see right now? Ananda said, I see the first come one hundred jeweled wheeled palms. On the Buddha's hand is the hallmark of a thousand spoked wheel. Ananda refers to it as the hundred jeweled wheeled palm, opening and closing in the midst of the assembly. Asura, the Buddha said to Ananda, You see my hand open and close in the assembly. Is it my hand that opens and closes, or is it your seeing that opens and closes? Ananda said, The world honored one's jeweled hand opened and closed in the assembly. I saw the first common's hand itself open and close. It was not my seeing nature that opened and closed. Commentary The Buddha said to Ananda, You see my hand open and close in the assembly. Is it my hand that opens and closes, or is it your seeing that opens and closes? When you see my fist opening and closing, is it my fist that opens and closes, or is it your seeing of my fist that does the opening and closing? Ananda said, The world honored one's jeweled hand opened and closed in the assembly. I saw the first common's hand itself open and close. He said, World honored one, it is your hundred jeweled wheeled palm that opens and closes. It was not my seeing nature that opened and closed. My seeing nature, which does the seeing, does not open and close. It is you that made the movement which caused me to see your hand open and close. Sutra, the Buddha said, What moves and what is still? Commentary. The Buddha was still concerned that Ananda had not genuinely understood, so he asked a further question. The Buddha said, What moves and what is still? Sutra Ananda said, The Buddha's hand does not remain at rest, and since my signature is beyond even stillness, how could it not be at rest? Commentary Ananda said, The Buddha's hand does not remain at rest. In other words, it moved, and since my seeing nature is beyond even stillness, how could it not be at rest? Why does he say it doesn't even have the characteristic of stillness? Because stillness comes from movement. If there isn't any movement, then basically there isn't any stillness. So it is said that there is no coming out of the great Shura Gama Samadhi and no entering it. That's the principle here. Nagas are always in Samadhi. There is never a time when they are not in Samadhi. With the Suragama Samadhi, Nagas, that is dragons, are always in Samadhi. Since they are never not in Samadhi, they never enter it and never leave it. Thus, Ananda said, My seeing nature by which I see you is devoid even of stillness. It is beyond the characteristic of movement or its opposite stillness. Without movement, there is no stillness. Both characteristics are gone. They are fundamentally unobtainable, non-existent, and they cannot be found. Then, how could it not be addressed? Ananda's answer shows that it is clear that since the seeing nature doesn't even have the characteristic of stillness, how could it possibly have movement? It does not move. Sutra, the Buddha said, so it is. Commentary. Once again, the Buddha agrees. The Buddha said, so it is. What you say is right. 
that's the way it is. Sutra then from his wheel of palm, the thirst common sent a precious ray of light flying to Ananda's right. Ananda immediately turned his head and glanced to the right. He then sent another ray of light to Ananda's left. Ananda again turned his head and glanced to the left. The Buddha said to Ananda, Why did your head move just now? Ananda said, I saw the thirst come on emit a wonderful precious light which came by my left and right. And so I looked to the left and right. My head moved up itself. Commentary and then from his wheeled palm, the thirst come on sent a precious ray of light flying to Ananda's right. From the Buddha's hundred jeweled wheeled palm, the ray of light flew swift as a bird or like a such light which shoots light out into space so that things can be seen from great distances. That's more or less what it was like. It could also be likened to a flash light in that as soon as you turn it on, the light shows out. The precious light which the Buddha can emit from his hand is clearer than the light of a flashlight. However, as soon as the precious light went flying by Ananda on his right side, Ananda immediately turned his head and glanced to the right. He turned his head to watch where the light flew and how far. He then sent another ray of light to Ananda's left. From the Buddha's wheeled palm came forth another ray of light. Where did it go? It went to Ananda's left. Ananda again turned his head and glanced to the left. He took a look to his left. The Buddha said to Ananda, Why did your head move just now? The Buddha questioned Ananda further. Why did your head move as you glanced left and right? Ananda said, I saw the first common emit a wonderful precious light which came by my left and right, and so I looked to the left and right. My head moved up itself. It came by my right side and then by my left side. My head moved because I was watching the light. Sutra Ananda, when I glanced at the Buddha's light and moved your head to the left and right, was it your head that moved or your seeing that moved? Word or not one, my head moved of itself. Since my seeing nature is beyond even cessation, how could it move? Commentary, the Buddha asked Ananda again, Ananda, when you glanced at the Buddha's light and moved your head to the left and right, was it your head that moved or your seeing that moved? Which moved back and forth, your head or your seeing nature? World honored one, my head moved up itself. Ananda answered that his head moved by itself. Since my seeing nature, which is capable of seeing, is beyond even sensation, how could it move? It doesn't even have the characteristic of seizing. The meaning is the same as in the previous passage. If the seeing nature has no characteristic of sensation, which is to say, if it has no characteristic of stillness, then it can't have the characteristic of movement either. This is how Ananda answered the Buddha. The seeing nature is in the state of unmoving suchness. Sutra, the Buddha said, so it is. Commentary, the Buddha said, what you've just said is right. The Buddha said, so it is. You perceived the principle correctly. Earlier you mistook a thief for your son when you insisted on taking false thinking to be your true mind. But now you understand that your seeing nature does not move. How there is a little hope. Now there is a little hope for you. Thus the Buddha replies in a pleased way with a word of praise. Sutra. Then the first come one told everyone in the great assembly. Suppose other living beings called what moves the dust and what does not drown the guest. Commentary. At that point, the Buddha told the Great Assembly, Now that you've heard me explain this doctrine, it's certain that you all understand it very clearly. There's no need for me to say more. But suppose other living beings called what moves the dust and what does not drown the guest. Perhaps there are other living beings who call, call dust the things which move and name guest. 
What does not reside at a place? Why is it that way? Sutra, you noticed that it was Ananda's head that moved. The thing did not move. You also noticed that it was my hand which opened and closed. The thing did not stretch or bend. Commentary, you noticed that it was Ananda's head that moved. The thing did not move. You, in the great assembly, watched Ananda's head turn back and forth. And Ananda just said the thing nature is unmoving. You also noticed that it was my hand which opened and closed. The thing did not stretch or bend. It wasn't the thing nature that stretched out or flexed. So Chua, why do you continue to take something moving like your body and its environment to be in substantial existence so that from the beginning to the end, your every thought is subject to production and extinction. Commentary. Here the Buddha goes the great assembly, he says. Now you have seen very clearly that the same nature does not move. Then why do you continue to take something moving like your body and its environment to be in substantial existence? You in the great assembly are unable to see your own genuine same nature. You take your physical body and the environment in which it finds itself to be a real thing. You react to the moving of your body and surroundings as if they were actual. These movements are basically external. They are not something that belongs to your self-nature. So that from the beginning to the end, your every thought is subject to production and extinction. You cling tenaciously to your body and mind as your host. You use the conscious mind in your thinking and every thought of your conscious mind is subject to production and extinction. First, one thought arises and is extinguished and then the next thought arises and is extinguished. Production and extinction follows production and extinction. You concentrate your effort exclusively on the realm of production and extinction. You have no true understanding of the seeing nature. Sutra, you have lost your true nature and conduct yourself in upside down ways. Having lost your true nature and mind, you recognize objects as yourself and it is you who cling to the flowing and turning of the revolving wheel. Commentary, now the Buddha goes everyone and tells the great assembly it is wrong. You have lost your true nature from beginning this time to the present. You have all lost your true nature. It is not truly lost, but it seems to be lost. Why? Because living beings don't perceive the unmoving, unshakable realm of the self-nature, and so they have not understood this doctrine. It is as if it is lost and conduct yourself in upside-down ways. Basically, when you do things, you should do them well, but you continually botch them up. It's, that's called doing things in an uh, upside-down way. It is what is meant by upside-down. I'll give you an example. A man is upside-down when his feet are on top and his head is on the bottom. Or else, your feet are on the bottom and your head is on top. But you take your shoes and put them on your head and you wear your head on your feet. That's also called upside-down. When you were little and your parents sent you off to school and you didn't want to go, that too was a case of being upside down. When people are trying to sleep and you make a lot of noise, yelling and carrying on so they can't sleep, you're acting upside down. In general, things which are not done in accord with propriety are called upside down. It's to turn your back on the way and run off. You want to go south to South San Francisco, but you end up going north to North San Francisco. That's to be upside down and going backwards. Having lost your true nature and mind, you recognize such objects as yourself. Because you conduct yourself in upside down ways, your nature and mind do not work together and thus you lose track of the true and actual nature. You mistake outside states as yourself. That means you recognize that in your in of yours as yourself, 
you shouldn't think that your in is you. That's to recognize objects as yourself. Objects here refers to all external objects. And it is you who cling to the flowing and turning of the revolving wheel. Because you recognize things as you, yourself, you produce all kinds of attachments. You fail to see through all kinds of things. You aren't clear about principle, and because of that, you cling to flowing and turning that is to birth and death. You yourself are attached to dying. You go looking for birth and death. If you yourself went upside down, if you didn't mistake a thief for your son and objects for yourself, you would be able to end birth and death. If you want to end birth and death, it is an easy thing to do. All you need to do is turn yourself around. If you go forward, you head right down the path of birth and death. If you turn around and go the other way, you end birth and death. It's not that difficult. It's just that it's up to you to do it. You simply turn around. You turn your head and pivot your body. That's all that's needed. It is said, the sea of suffering is boundless. A turn of the head is the other straw.